cool off, yes. A crash, totally something different. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the housing market, four reasons why the housing market will not crash, maybe cool off and slow down, like the Federal Reserve said. But ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and make sure you hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. And as always, and as always, this is your gracious host. Welcome to the Princess Prince of Investment with your host, Prince Dice. Coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado, via Honolulu, Hawaii. So the first thing I want to talk about today is the housing market crash, right? Everybody's saying, oh, my God, how's the market in the last two, three years? It's been a tremendous bubble. And now after the bubble, we're going to have a crash. I'm going to give you four reasons why. The number one reason thing is post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD. You heard me right. Prince, what are you talking about? Post-traumatic stress syndrome. Isn't that like a people who experience dramatic things and how they think about them? Yes. This generation has been one generation that has sat back and watched a housing crash happen throughout the world in 2007, 2008, 2009, right? So back when the housing market happened back in 2009, well, um, myself, I was stationed in, I was overseas in Iraq in 08, some of Iraq, and I was in San Diego. And I was, it intimidated me from then on from buying a house. I saw so many people lose their houses. I saw so many people lose their jobs, lose their clearances. I saw the worst of the worst. It made it, it made the renters look like smart people. And it made the people who went out there and bought houses look like not idiots, but not so smart. The thing is, especially in my in my career in the military, the big thing that people would do, they would get stationed somewhere in San Diego. They would buy a house, hold it for two or three years, turn around and sell it, rent it, walk away after a year or two with $100,000, $50,000, $67,000 in profit from a house. Sometimes they walk away with a little bit more. They go into the next house and they continue to flip houses, buy their first house, second house, third house. Everything was great. That is until, like everything else, the bubble burst. When the bubble burst, a lot of people got left holding the bag. They intimidated me, and that made me scared of seeing the housing market when it was doing well. Prince, what does it have to do now? We're in 2022. Now we fast forward today. We're 14 years later from 2008, and everybody in the last five years, every time we see the housing market start to do well, we automatically think, hold on, wait, wait, wait. It's about to do bad. It's about to do bad. It's about to do bad, right? There's no in-between. We know we think it's going to be a boom or it's going to be a bust. There could be no in-between. Just like we know we have a bullish market, we have a bearish market, but we also have a market called a consolidated market, meaning the market is moving sideways. Now, Prince, why do you say this? A lot of people, since we've seen those bad times, we think they're going to happen again. Now, you go back before 2008 and ask yourself, when did we see a last housing market correction and crash like we saw in 08. Ladies and gentlemen, that goes all the way back to 1929. You know, that's known as the Great Depression, when we saw dramatic housing prices drop. We saw a little bit in the 80s, but not like uh, we saw in 29 or in 2008. You look at how far apart is that? 70, almost 80 years apart, right? But the thing about it is, why do we continuously wait on a bus? Because we've just seen one. We saw the stock market crash in 2008, and we saw, the, we saw a pandemic come along, and we have also seen the housing market crash. So that makes people a lot um, very weary when we look at the housing market just doubling and tripling and just shooting up all across the nation. I agree, ladies and gentlemen. It's definitely a seller's market. But as you, if you can pay attention to the housing market, you can see the cool down. Look at that cool down. While the cool down is happening, two things that are happening. We have interest rates. You know, just about two years ago, the average interest rate was in the low twos. Even you can catch the uh, the high ones, 1. 1.8. Most people got a 2.5 uh, or 2.25 or 2.75 that I've seen back in 2000. I mean, back in 2020. Now you fast forward to 2022, the average mortgage rate is four to five percent. What does that mean? That's a lot. Anybody that has purchased homes and no homes, that's a lot when you're talking about adding up into a mortgage that makes a house more affordable. I will tell you this. When I purchased my home, if it was at 5%, it would probably be unaffordable for me, right? But at the time, interest rates are very low. When interest rates are very low, it allows, it allows you to purchase more home for your money. When interest rates go up, it allows you to pur purchase less home for your money because a lot of your mortgage is going to interest. Now, this is cooling off the market. 
two things has happened. You take my neighborhood, for example. Um, when I moved into the neighborhood, it was probably about a $400,000 neighborhood, almost a half a million at the time. Now you look at it today, it's over 600000 right? So not only is the housing market, the houses are 600000 but the mortgage rate is about 5% when you look at a 30-year uh, fixed mortgage rate, right? So when you look at this, the house is now way, way more unaffordable. Two things has happened. We all know as the value of a home, a home goes up, so does the taxes. So the taxes are way higher because the value, you know, when you get, you have to pay your property tax, the property taxes are higher because you no longer have a $400,000 home. You got a $600,000 home. So one, the taxes are higher. When the taxes are higher, you know, that pushes, that pushes up the mortgage. When the interest rates have doubled, that also pushes up the mortgage. And then not to mention the house is worth more and costs more. That itself makes the house more unaffordable. And when something is more unaffordable, it is less desirable. When something is less desirable, you're going to have less people in the buying pot, which is in turn going to cool off the market. So when I go to sell my home, the buyer is going to, it may, we're going to go from a seller's market into a buyer's market. We know this is going to happen. Now the buyer may turn around and say, Hey Prince, you know what? No, I want these walls repainted and I want this, uh, bathroom upgraded and you got a leak in your shower and your toilet has a little uh the shower makes a little noise and your toilet makes a little noise when you flush it i want all those things fixed so when i purchased my home people was buying anything they were overbidding now people are going to underbid you and they're going to demand more for you in order to sell your home so homes are not going to be easier to sell and that's not a bad thing that's kind of balancing out the market a little bit you kind of want a little bit of tug of war and when you're buying and selling that's called a good old supply and demand and we're trying to find that equilibrium but it won't be a crash i don't think we're going to turn around and say oh man this house said it was worth six hundred thousand. now it's only worth 300. i don't see that like a lot of people assume now let's go into a couple of things that i've written down here number one thing is inventory we're still ladies and gentlemen in a short inventory supply when you look at the market Across the board, you still see inventory is very low, right? We look at the latest housing report put out the bank by the Mortgage Bankers Association. The consumer building, when you look at consumer building, inventory still remains low. So right now you still have a good bit of buyers that are there and supply has not met the buyer's demand. So with that uh, inventory being a little bit low, you can tell right there that is not going to be a crash into the market. Another thing is number two. Um, no one wants to sell. You kind of see in the housing market, not a lot of people who already have homes are looking to sell homes. Number one reason being is like, oh, look, I made $200,000 in equity. But if you sell your home and take $200,000 in equity, all you're going to do is turn around and go buy another home that's overvalued, right? So for prime example, let's take someone who lives up here in Denver, Colorado. If you sell your house and make $100,000, 150 maybe two hundred thousand dollars and then you go off to san diego california now you're going to buy a house for a million dollars <laughs> to get the same thing the same thing that you had in denver it doesn't make it seem like it was all that great of a deal when you go to the next market right so that's the first thing that we notice when we look at the housing market a lot of people don't want to sell because the people who have how who have houses who have nice equity you're not going to get the biggest bang for your buck as you go shop around currently in a seller's market so you don't want to be on the buying side in a seller's market right so the second um so that's one big reason people are not willing to sell when people are not willing to sell that makes inventory um that hurts inventory because there's not as many houses on the market. So if people are willing to keep their houses, not that many people are trying to sell their houses, um, you don't see a crash. What happens is when we saw in 08, when you have a lopsided effect, where you have a high inventory and a low amount of buyers, that's what drives down the market. That's what causes us to have a crash. When you go into a neighborhood and all the houses are foreclosed on and not that many people want to buy the houses, that itself, ladies and gentlemen, when you have that's when you get into a crash or a bear market because people just start selling their house for anything i lived back in 08 but i wasn't as a uh astute investor back then i didn't understand really what was going on i come from the south from the country where people didn't purchase their first home till they was in their late 40s and 50s that's if they even purchased a home um that's when people kind of purchase home i didn't really see too many 20 and 30 years old 30 year olds buying homes, you know, in my little small town.
right? So that goes back to my, that goes back to uh, number three. Number three, the biggest buyer base for homes last year in 2021 was millennials. Back in 2008, it had this notion that millennials wouldn't be affording houses and nor would they buy houses. That that American green dream of eating an apple pie behind a white picket fence and that nice suburban home with a dog and a wife and two kids, that American dream had changed and millennials were no longer interested. According to the data in 2021, that's no longer true. Millennials still want houses and they are still buying houses and they are a big consumer base. As our baby boomer market starts to die off, not start to die off, but it's not dying off, but it's becomes more elderly, now we have this millennial market that's out looking to purchase homes like we didn't expect. A lot of them are not buying homes downtown, but they are moving out to the suburbs and purchasing homes. So when you have that consumer base um, willing to purchase homes, it makes it has a buyer market. Now, the other thing I want to put into play as well is we have companies out there, you know, that's been on the show here called Roofstock. Now, Prince, what does Roofstock mean? Roofstock is a company um, where people who live in San Francisco, of course, the average everyday person who lives in San Francisco cannot afford a home. Let's look at the average millennial that live in Denver. You probably cannot afford a home. Let's say if you do something as basic as like, hey, I'm a college student and I work at Chipotle and I drive Uber. You're probably not going to afford a single family home in Denver, Colorado, which the average home price is $600,000, a little bit over $600,000. And also the average mortgage, 30 year mortgage interest rate is about four or 5%. That means on average, your mortgage is going to be north to $3,000 a month. And if you're doing a job like working at Chipotle and Uber, that's going to be a little bit strenuous to do. So a lot of people, college graduates are walking out of school. They're getting salaries like thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, maybe something like that. If you have a family, it's hard to support a family on fifty, sixty thousand dollars when half or over half of your income is going to just to have a mortgage. You know, seventy five percent of the income, right? So houses are now becoming a little bit uh, less affordable, but it still doesn't take away from the fact that millennials still want houses. And also people who live in high cost areas like New York, L.A., uh, but anywhere in California. <laughs> but when you live in high cost areas like New York, L.A., Chicago, uh, some of the high cost areas. Now, millennials have a new technology to where they don't have to buy houses, nor are they buying houses where they live. They are going to lower cost areas. For prime example, they purchase their houses in places like Michigan, where you can purchase a home for hundred thousand dollars or less. Places like Alabama, especially in the southern region, region where you have Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia, um, Louisiana, some of the small areas that are not as populated, not as popular, you're able to buy homes and rent them out and have tenants uh, for hundred thousand dollars or less which comes out to be maybe three, 400 bucks a month if you're purchasing a house, right? So with that being said, people can purchase a home for $100,000 and with $100,000, they can purchase a home and not only um, purchase a home, but also have a renter. So people are renting where they live and they're purchasing where they rent, if that makes sense. Hope that's not a ton to twister. So for example, I live in San Francisco. I can't afford a home in San Francisco, but I do make enough money to afford afford rent in San Francisco, and I can purchase a rental property in the South, somewhere like Mississippi, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, South Carolina, things like that. So those are things you have to pay attention to uh, that's offered right now. People can go online right now and purchase homes in places that they don't live in for a significantly lower price than their current area. Hey, I can't afford a $600,000 house, but I sure can afford a $100,000 house with a renter or a tenant that's in it. Great investment property and a great way to purchase home. So you talk about doing this. People had the opportunity to do this um, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, but it wasn't as popular, nor did we have the technology to reach out to anyone. Now, the next thing, um, as we wrap up the show today, um, we said millennials. We talked about millennials. We talked about people not wanting to purchase their house. And we talked about low inventory. Low inventory still remains. People don't want to purchase, uh, sell their homes. Millennials are still buying homes, making the biggest percentage of the consumer base. And also, we're looking at the consumer balance sheet. That's another reason. When you look at the consumer balance sheet, people are still, um, when you look at the consumer debt and balance sheets that people have, the balance sheets are still in good favor to where people can go out and purchase homes. So when you look at these factors that are in there, um, yes, 
the housing market is doing what it's supposed to do. Interest rates are going up. It's going to cool off the market. Just like we just saw today, Jerome Powell came out and said, yeah, we can sell. A, we can see ourselves um, raising interest rates by 0.5%. And the market continued to go down after that news broke. Even though we had Tesla that had great earnings today, the market continued to tank due off of the news that um, interest rates are going up. So interest rates, are they crashing the market? No, they're cooling off the market. And when you cool off the market, um, when you cool off the market, it doesn't mean you're going to have a crash. It means that you're trying to even things out. You know, you don't want an extremely high seller's market. Eventually, you want to kind of cool it off where it can be balanced out, where you can have a seller's market and a buyer's, buyer's market to meet that equilibrium. But ladies and gentlemen, those are my points right there. Those are my four points right there. While we won't see a housing market crash, maybe a cool off, maybe a little bit stabilizing, because real estate is only supposed to move at 3% a year. Now that 40% a year that has been moving at these last couple of years, that's extremely high. But when interest rates are going up, it's drying up the uh, buyer's market a little bit, cooling off a little bit. Houses are not jumping up. Just because your house go up 10% in 2022 doesn't mean the housing market crash happens. It means that, hey, things are kind of coming back down. Um, evaluations are coming back down to reality. You know, I mean, it's unreal to purchase a home for $400,000 and a year and a half later it's worth $600,000. It's pretty unrealistic. If you keep up on that rate, that means that the interest rate is probably the house is compounding at like what 30% a year, which is crazy. That I mean in a 10 year run, the house will be worth about 1.5 million. This is just me uh, using a guesstimate, but that's not unrealistic and unsustainable. So interest rates drying just because we're sitting in the housing market, um, we're going to see less people want to buy houses. Doesn't mean we're going to have a crash. We're trying to correct. That's why the Federal Reserve raised interest rates for the first time in 10, 15 years um, by 0.25 a month ago. Now he's talking about doing by uh, 50 base points again. And as these interest rates go up, it's going to make assets more and more less desirable. Like we all know, when interest rates are low, assets, that's how we create bubbles, right? When interest rates are high, this is when we can see assets are priced low. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's my time. I hope you guys and girls enjoyed it. The four reasons why we won't see a housing market crash, but a cool down maybe. Um, hope you guys and girls got something out of this. Until the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else crazy you see, see us do around the globe, make sure you hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. Share this with a friend and a family member. And my name is Prince Dykes. I'm the Prince of Investment. Peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.